glad everyone is here on time. Thank you very much. We just seen somebody out to see if uh, we want to bring in some stragglers for the round table. So we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Uh, we've had, unfortunately had one cancellation at the last minute. Jessica White is unable to um, be with us today. So um, I'll be introducing both of our speakers and they'll tell you a little bit about themselves and then we'll have lots of room for questions and answers at the end. <laughs> It looks like people will be coming in as they're ready. Uh, well, good afternoon. I hope you've loaded up on caffeine and we can make it through to uh, dinner with as much fun as we've had this morning. Um, my name is Michelle Eri. I'm an assistant professor in gender studies here at UCLA. I'm originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and my tribe's in Ngāpuhi and Ngātipurō. And um, I just want to remind us all that we're on Tongva land here today. Um, Welcome to the round table that we have set up for this afternoon on social media and activism. Uh, I've asked both of the speakers to actually tell us a little bit about themselves before they start their presentations. <laughs> but we're very lucky today to have with us uh, Nami Hatfield from the University of California, Los Angeles, and Elaine from the University of Illinois. So we'll speak in order if that's okay. Um, is that how you've set up? Okay, great. So please join me in welcoming Nami. <laughs> Hello, I am Nami Hatfield. I am a graduate student in the Library and Information Sciences program here at UCLA. Um, and my focus has been largely on both media theory as well as transgender archiving and memory reception. Um, do you know how to turn on? I think oh, someone should come up and help us with that. That would be great. should probably get started for everyone. Um, the research that I'm presenting today is research on transgender webcomics and their use of participatory culture. Um, with many forms of media and art and design, there's a claim that within mainstream LGBTIQ type culture that transgender identity is represented, but this is often kind of misleading. Many times in forms of media, there's really a designated focus upon sexuality. In particular, gay and lesbian identities are typically highlighted, though bisexual identity is occasionally an aspect. For this reason, gender-based topics are often an afterthought or absent within these mainstream forms of media. And because of this absence, there's a major need for the transgender community to form their own media and to fill this need in a variety of ways. And this brings up a very interesting question, which is how does the transgender community actually use 
media, art, and design to really promote identity and to attract and educate allies. There are a variety of answers to this question. Um, today I'm just going to be focusing on fandom and participatory forms of culture in the form of webcomics to answer this question, but there are many other forms of media that the community uses in terms of this. Um, in particular, I'm going to be looking at today Rain and Maho Shonen Fight, which are comics used as a means of sharing and educating ally with allies, and how this interest within this media has really developed within the concepts of sharing, fandom, and circulation through the interwebs. <laughs> Um, first off, I want to give a brief background in each of these series. The webcomic series Rain was started in 2010 by transgender artist and writer Jocelyn Samara. It was originally planned as an action fantasy series, and the story really evolved into its current form now, which explores a realistic depiction of transgender and queer identities. Rain follows the transgender youth Rain Flattery and describes her complex life living with her bisexual aunt Farah and attending a private Catholic school. In this comic, Rain discovers that despite living in a small town, there are a number of people who identify as LGBTQ or who are strong allies to the community. But despite this, really has a number of conflicts and trials that she has to face due to her identity as a transgender woman especially with regards to her brother and sister. Um, these experiences help to represent the way everyday life and issues are faced by those who identify as lesbian, gay, and bisexual and queer, but is especially focused upon transgender experiences and genderqueer experiences. Ma Who Shown in Fight is a webcomic series started in the same year of 2010 by a genderqueer artist and writer team, Dusty Jack and Jade Prince. The series focuses upon a cast of mostly male individuals with a variety of nationalities and backgrounds who all attend an international-based high school. The series really draws heavily from the magical girl genre, which is a Japanese genre known for bright flashing designs, flamboyant costuming, transformation, energetic posing, and a young girl's use of magic to battle forces of evil. While the series does contain a plot to save the world from evil spirits of pollution and has the heroes wearing the brightly colored outfits, there's a major twist on this concept by having all the main characters as mostly male. However, the character that I really want to focus upon in this eh, presentation is the genderqueer, super glitzy, and self-proclaimed leader of the team, who is Raji who cross-dresses during transformations and is accompanied by a grumpy, extra-masculine spirit, Autumn. These comics are really remarkable because they capture really a variety of experiences that transgender people have, and a variety of approaches toward that education and humanizing of the transgender community. While both are taking radically different approaches, they both share an interest in developing a fan base of both transgender and non-transgender readers. Rain focuses upon, as I mentioned before, a more realistic depiction of transgender life and queer identity, whereas Maho Shonen Fight takes a more fantasy and action-based approach to the story, which focuses mostly upon male characters, with the exception of Raji. Um, while they're taking radically different approaches, both are really effective because they make these portrayals and experiences so varied and use a participatory form of culture and fandom to interact with the reader. Participatory culture is particularly useful when looking at forms of new media theory, when observing fandom and explaining the development of webcomics. The theory largely was developed by new media theorist Henry Jenkins and really contrasts the traditional modes of media theory, which was largely consumer and corporate based before. Um, participatory models of culture really does away with the strict, the, the strict di distinctions between creator and consumer, and instead really blurs the lines between these two positions. And within a participatory culture, fans often feel as though their contributions are really making a difference in the overall product that is being produced. 
While participatory forms of cultures have existed before the internet in forms of fandom publications, such as independent zines, fanzines, and letters to the editor, this form of circulation and feedback was really highly restricted. The small print publications prior to the internet were really limited in their ability for readers and creators to form or maintain really lasting long distance relationships with each other. However, with the mass circulation of Web 2.0, fans and community members now really have a platform which enables really low barriers of entry and allows for small community-based fandoms around such medium to form and for transgender topics to really be discussed in a way that would not be discussed in mainstream publications. This allows smaller scale work such as Rain and Mahu Shonen Fight to really be shared and form these communities and enables individuals to communicate not only with the creator of the works but also among potential fans and other individuals. This in turn really allows information and conversation about transgender identity and experience to be spread to both those who can directly relate with characters' experiences as well as those who are seeking more information through the reading of these web comics. Both of these works really use the internet's ability to communicate in the comics medium as a tool of expression of identity to develop these solid fan bases. The format of a free webcomic is really helpful because it does offer really low barriers of entry and immediately allows fans to be involved in the work and have a direct form of interaction between the creators and the consumers of material through commentary, both on fan home pages, as well as Facebook groups and Tumblr groups, DeviantArt, a variety of media platforms. And that is demonstrated right there. Um, it's a little blurry on the screen right now, but to the left is Rain's homepage. And Jocelyn, the creator, can be seen engaging in a dialogue with people. And to the right is a DeviantArt fan page for Maho Shonen Fight, where again you see that dialogue and interaction. Um, this allows for an instant, instantaneous, almost flow of ideas and a really a sharing of concepts and experiences and information that really isn't possible through traditional print-based media because of those limitations within print-based media. Another important aspect to denote with these works is that they bring in a variety of communities both Rain and Mahu Shonen Fight are clearly drawing influence from the creators, from Japanese forms of media fandom, such as anime and manga fandom, and LGBTIQ struggles in the community within the United States. Rain is clearly a work that Jocelyn Samara has inserted her own experiences into, as well as reached out to fans in order to shape the direction of. Jocelyn stated about Rain, I've been calling Rain pseudo-autobiographical, having not openly accepted myself as transgender until age 20. Obviously, that means I never attempted to pass undetected in high school like Rain. That being said, beyond the basic setup of the story, it's pretty largely based off of my personal experiences, people that I've met, things that I've heard, etc., for better or worse. And frequently, Jocelyn will communicate with fans for information on how they feel about the comics, as well as the experiences they have in situations as LGBTIQ people. This allows Jocelyn to really tackle very difficult issues within her comics, such as teenage pregnancy, homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, disclosure, and coming out, and to really further blur this line between who is the creator and who is consuming the media. This allows fans to really feel invested in the development of Rain and to really form fan groups freely, and also allows Jocelyn makes a platform for her own personal experiences and to educate readers about these experiences from a really personal perspective. And that image right there is of Jocelyn 
And that came from a Rain fan page of somebody dressing up as Rain through a cosplay tradition, which is often associated with fandom culture. Mago Shonen Fight draws experience from a variety of sources, including the two gender queer creators in fandom, but also from the magical girl genre of Japanese media, and has really been made possible within print form through participatory platforms such as Kickstarter. Maho Shonen Fight clearly draws influence from works like Sailor Moon, as you can see above, taking at times exact images from works, and really draws upon the idea of convergence culture, which again is an idea created by Henry Jenkins, who states that convergence culture is the flow of content across multiple media platforms, the cooperation between multiple media industries and the migration of behavior of media audiences who would go almost anywhere in search of the type of entertainment experiences they wanted. It's clear that Jade Prince and Dusty Jack, as well as Jocelyn, have really borrowed from Japanese media in both style and thematic content within their works to meet needs of fans. And this is illustrated in Rain, where Jocelyn creates a favorite series for Rain that's made up um, based off of, clearly off of anime and manga series called Black Queen Kan Kaninamari and has a number of popular anime and manga series which are given parody titles that anime and manga fans would be familiar with such as Kill Book, Dragon Cube A, Hard Still Physicist. Both of them clearly are drawing from the idea of convergence culture though, and designing stories that are for and influenced by fans of anime and manga culture. Maho Shonen Fight um, emphasizes also a diversity of queer identity and just diversity in general. Jade Prince stated in their Kickstarter campaign for Maho Shonen Fight, the first print-based novel, that the we, the creators, wanted to create a story and world with endless diversity in terms of gender expression, sexuality, cultural experience, and ethnicity. It is clear, however, that Raji demonstrates not only a commitment to diversity of gender expression, but also that of gender identity. In a panel in Comic-Con International 2014, both creators confirm that Raji and their fiance both identify as genderqueer and non-conforming, and it is clear within the comic that Raji is a character that really can't be easily defined in terms of gender identity. In many ways, Raji's fluid perspective toward gender is really represented by their alter ego, Miss Autumn Injuni, which is represented as a character that's liberating for many transgender fans, especially those who are really uncomfortable with the idea of gender binaries within works and who enjoy an escape from really normative standards of gender and representations of gender. Raji's character really helps to highlight one of the other goals of the creators, which is to create a story we would have liked to have seen as teens, but just didn't exist. A genre story that we could see ourselves in. Even into adulthood, we as queer people still long for representation in the media, for the opportunity to see someone like us among all the other faces, and to feel in that moment a little less like an outsider. Raji presents a character that both fans and creators of the work can really relate to as a person and really, really want to read in and share in. Even for non-transgender readers, this sort of character is really liberating, humanizing, and amusing, and represents a similarity to a variety of other flamboyant and charismatic characters. And this is illustrated by, again, his connection to Tamaki from Orin High School Host Club which in its own way is a very subversive show in terms of gender, and is again drawn from that convergence culture tradition of pulling in anime and manga into works. While Raji as a character is portrayed very differently from Kai, who's the gender queer character in Rain, they both bring highly effective approaches from the creators to bring out identity and experiences for those who are representing as genderqueer. 
Well, webcomics are only one of the many ways that the community really takes advantage of media as a form of expression and attracting allies. It's really proven a highly effective means and has really blurred the lines of traditional culture as a result between creators and the consumer. It has really allowed fans to network and to really communicate almost instantaneously and form fandom community spaces with ease, something that just was not possible before the advent of the internet. This has these works also have really set the stage for further explorations of gender within webcomic narratives and has inspired many webcomic writers who are both transgender and cisgender alike to explore gender narratives in their webcomics. And this makes webcomics a very effective tool for transgender creators, readers, and allies, and really allows them to be invested within transgender perspectives from a variety of spectrums. Thank you. Yeah, it's flashing, it's turning, it's okay. warming up. Thank you. Okay. It sounds good. Okay. Okay. okay, so while we're waiting, I could introduce myself. Uh, my name is Elaine Yuelingji. Uh, I study comparative literature at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I'm interested in generally LGBTQ literatures and films, and recently I've been working on problems of affect and the body. Um, cool. Great. Um, Hello. Yeah, okay. Uh, the title of my paper is Intimate Matters, Bodies, Things, and Animacy in the Feminist Little Tampon Group. Uh, it looks at the feminist little tampon group in the scroll of science and technology studies and affect theory. Uh, the feminist little tampon group is actually a Chinese internet group and forum that promotes the use of the menstrual tampon. Since its establishment on uh, December the 26th, 2007, uh, the group has gathered over 10,000 members and produced over 1,000 discussion threads. Uh, the group self-identifies to be feminist. On the front page, group founder Sasa Su writes that the official purpose of the feminist little tampon group is to demystify the use of a tampon, to get to know a woman's body and herself, and to counteract the patriarchal notions behind the tampon taboo. Okay, situated in uh, critical menstruation studies, my project is to look at the sexualized ways in which a supposedly inanimate instrument is bonded with the body. The feminist little tampon group suggests that the tampon is neither a senseless object forever regulated by the human body, nor a stigmatized, depraved agent that contaminates female sexual morality. Rather, the tampon is animate and at, at, and at times unmanageable. It responds and reacts to the menstruating body, formulating a queer intimacy in a therapeutic publicness. Uh, 
Ultimately, what I propose to reconsider here is the problem of materiality and the relationship between bodies and things. Uh, in the Chinese market, the tampon is a product mainly imported from the United States. Consequently, the members of this particular internet group tend to associate the tampon with a Western liberal feminism that is specially labeled American. Uh, that's where the, the title of the group comes from. Uh, but with this neoliberal ideology of transnationalism in mind, I am actually unable to discover any critical study of the tampon or menstruation in China. So my secondary sources here are all in the English language. Uh, while there remains a realistic academic gap to suture, I hope this project can open up uh, itineraries through which the comparative methodology could cultivate uh, theoretical conversations. So here are the three um, subtopics of the presentation today. Uh, uh, the first one would be tampon and or vaginal sex. The second one is on um, manageability and animacy. Uh, the third one is about intimacies. Let's go into the first one. Uh, the tampon has always been regarded as uncanny and sexy. That the vagina is part of the female reproductive system seems to presuppose an automatic connection between various kinds of sex acts surrounding the, uh, the, the vagina and the tampon which is located within the vagina. Especially when tampons are used by young women who have not yet experienced sexual intercourse, the issue of hymen protection becomes a center of debate for both the commercial market and the academia. In short, when we speak of menstruation and the tampon, vaginal sex is always present, whether we are for or against the use of the product itself. Uh, one of the positions in defense of the tampon is in fact an effort to disassociate the tampon from vaginal sex. Uh, in the 1940s, Dr. Robert Dickinson, a Dr. Robert Dickinson who is an American uh, doctor, conducted a physiological study of the hymen and tampon. He suggests that the tampon is recommended to women of all age and sexual experience because it does not lead to sexual arousal. The menstrual napkin, on the other hand, is unrecommended as it leads to friction and thus sexual stimulation. <laughs> this argument implies that a good menstrual hygiene product is one that has no implication for sexuality whatsoever. Sexuality should not be present when we, educated, when we educate children and teenagers about menstruation. With such an agenda in mind, Dr. Dickinson works to contain sexual awareness by relocating menstruation technology outside of sexuality, even though the very language of his argument is hypersexualized. On this aspect, the arguments and standpoints of the feminist little tampon group provokes my critical interest because their promotion of the tampon is anything but a divorce of the tampon and sexuality. The feminist little tampon group makes use of its own sexualized language to uh, think about the use of the tampon, presenting an alternative understanding of the connection between menstrual technology and human sexuality. Uh, for instance, this is the good part. Uh, a, large, uh, uh, a large number of the threads and discussions on the internet group are instructions and advices to, on how to insert a tampon. Uh, because when inexperienced members, uh, t they, 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 they oftentimes they complain that they cannot locate their vagina or they, cannot, they fail to insert uh, a tampon, things like that. Uh, but the advices given them can be highly sexual. For example, a common advice is to ask your boyfriend to help you. Um, for example, it says, uh, one friend let her boyfriend help her for her first time. It must be happy to have such a good boyfriend. Um, well, uh, another, another member makes the, uh, the connection to vaginal sex more explicit. She says that her boyfriend wants her to compare how the OB tampon and him feel inside her vagina. Uh, another advice given by one senior member uh, to those who have failed to insert the tampon is actually masturbation. 
Uh, the following paragraphs are given as an ultimate advice. It's basically asking the women to watch porns and get aroused so that vaginal lubrica lubrication will facilitate the insertion of the tampon. It's quite amazing to look at. <laughs> Uh, these discussions and devices are um, in very interesting conversation with the critical debate surrounding the tampon. Uh, there are a number of um, critical menstruation studies on specifically on the tampon, although they're not very well known. Uh, there are good studies of con conservative body politics, or in this case, the con conventional sexual morality in China value sexuality as something only after a certain age and only after marriage. Therefore, in order to market the tampon to menstruating women of all ages and different kinds of sexual activities, the product must be desexualized to be marketed. Uh, when critical scholars respond to these um, sexualizations and desexualizations, uh, they usually criticize the conservative sexual moralities stigmatizing the tampon and problematize the menstrual hygiene education, which is biopolitically coded. However, in this um, weird case of the feminist little tampon group, they have a grassroots activism that does not side with any of these um, scholarly positions. As they voluntarily situate masturbation and sexual intercourse within their understanding of the tampon, they emphasize uh, the intimate sensations of their body, as well as the very pragmatic techniques to use the product. Uh, these discourses and practices reverse the stigmatized and enforced sexualization of menstruation and traditional sexual um, morality. The second part of the presentation will be about um, manageability and unmanageability. Uh, the feminist little tampon group is concerned with two uh, major practical difficulties of using the tampon. The first one is the feeling of pain caused by the insertion and removal. Pain becomes an uh, effective channel that conjures up so many different issues regarding menstruation and sexuality, but in this presentation I'll spare us the pain and focus <laughs> on uh, another major uh, practical difficulty, which is um, um, getting lost. Uh, <laughs> according to one member of the feminist little tampon group, the most horrifying thing about using a tampon is when one forgets to remove it. Uh, at least, I have at least three different threads and posts and articles speak of the same problem. Um, some members say that they place the tampon very deep inside and then lose it. Um, one particular member has to visit the hospital to have it removed by a gynecologist. For her, the particular horror was that the string of the tampon has come off so that she is unable to locate it. In fact, she is unable to recall whether she has used the tampon at all. If According to uh, the historian, historian Shara Wallstrow, who uh, has uh, a number of um, critical studies on the tampon from a historical perspective, uh, the tampon facilitates menstruating women to pass as non-menstruating. Uh, if that is the case, an actual line must remain visible so that they will be able to control when and whether they terminate this passing. When the tampon string comes off, the difference between passing and not passing disappears. The person who uses the tampon loses track of her own passing. She literally does not know if she's managing her menstruation or not. In this case, the tampon seems to have a threatening animacy inside the body which rejects our man management. Um, two very interesting stories uh, are told by a woman on another Chinese internet group and an interviewee in a study of menstruation by the scholar Lara Friedenfield. Uh, the first woman, uh, who has the pseudonym of Miss Neurotic, she says that, uh, well, so the, the story goes that she one day she just cannot find the string to her tampon and she feels helpless and resentful about herself. 
she has to go to a gynecologist for help, but uh, the gynecologist cannot find anything in her vagina. Eventually, she realizes that she actually forgets to insert the tampon in the morning. <laughs> she leaves the hospital, and the worst part is that she is ridiculed by the gyne gynecologist and the nurses. Uh, the second story is similar and different at the same time. It, it, it is in an interview by Lara Friedenfeld. Uh, uh, this woman uh, recalls a funny, strange situation where she cannot locate her tampon. She calls her mom and sister-in-law for help, but she just never finds it. And after years and years after giving birth to three children, she now remarks in the interview that she must have at some point gotten it out but totally forgot. Uh, the two women here use very uh, different narrative frameworks to retell the story of losing a tampon. Uh, Miss Neurotic feels mortified by her negligence and incapability of managing her body. Uh, the second woman by the name of Barbara Ritchie, uh, she seems less embarrassed and more confident of the self-adjustability of her body. In, the, in either case, the tampon manifests its mobility and animacy. If, uh, if the ultimate goal of menstrual hygiene product as such is passing, as scholars have argued, then this technology must work to achieve a kind of manageability. I want the product to be in sight, to be within reach, to stay put in my body. And the object's proximity with the body is very precarious at this moment because the proximity itself must be fully controlled and managed in order to be good or acceptable. Whether it goes out of control, I myself become so panicked and horrified because I imagine it to be some sort of insurgence of my body that threatens my sovereignty. <laughs> Stories of tampon getting lost are, in fact, quite common. Uh, what I would like to emphasize here is that the tampon manifests manifest an animacy and mobility which will not be eliminated by the effort to contain it. It acts with an agenda that is not authorized by its user, which is me. Uh, besides, the two cases of Miss Neurotic and Barbara Ritchie that we talked about also reveal that this animacy can be double-edged. It certainly could be coded as a humiliating threat to uh, my physical sense of, of security, but it could also be funny, as if the body and the tampon establish intimate connections that are ungraspable, ungraspable for the consciousness of uh, myself. The accounts of a tampon getting lost in the vagina are so loaded because they demonstrate the unmanageability and illegibility of the non-human object in its relation to human beings. While we perceive the object to be inanimate, insentient, transparent, and utterly legible, the object defies our perception and eludes our reading. In the end, who wants to manage our bodies? Uh, is it the Sorry, in the end, who wants to manage menstruation? Is it the bodies that are menstruating? Is it the codes of passing that wish to wipe menstruation from public discourse? Or is it an anthropocentric and rather uncanny relation to anything non-human which simultaneously loathes and desires the transgressive sexualization of the object? Um, the last part is on intimacies. The term intimacy is widely used in gender and sexuality studies, but when we write of it, we do not always specify, specify or define what we mean. Uh, in Lauren Berlant's theory of intimacy, at the center of the modern ma mass-mediated sense of intimacy is a relation between desire and therapy. Intimacy is an aesthetic of attachment which incorporates both inwardness and publicness but it is also formed around threats to the image of the world it seeks to sustain. Uh, my own attachment to this particular choice of word, intimacy, is based on several reasons. Uh, I want to argue that uh, the feminist little tampon group, uh, weird as it is, is about the precarious handling of intimacy, be it an affect, a virtual connection on social media, or a physical action. There is a uh, politics of animacy attached to the word intimacy. 
The physical and emotional proximity behind the words conceptualization seems, only, seems to only work between animate individuals, those that have sentience for one thing and agency for another. Tampons, they have neither. Uh, a tampon is a roll of cotton with a string. Having absorbed menstrual discharge, it enlarges. Hence, how is intimacy possible between the body and the tampon? Or in other words, how is the body attached to an, to an inanimate object? Such an unlikely formulation of intimacy comes into light when a series of sexualized discourse situate the tampon in parallel to vaginal sex. It is queer sitting somewhere in between uh, menstrual, uh, sorry, sitting somewhere in between instrumental function and bodily sex, the former restricted to manageable non-human technology and the latter only available to humans and their consciousness. Furthermore, animacy introduces mutuality and reciprocity, so the tampon is no longer an insentient instrument lying motionless at the bottom of some hierarchy. A special and materialized intimacy emerges. It reconfigures the relationship between bodies and things. In short, the supposedly inanimate matter is given a sex life. When the feminist little tampon group teaches its members to masturbate in order to insert the tampon, sexual pleasure, bodily serenity, and the unmanageability of the object come to a very subtle convergence. In addition to the physical proximity of the menstruating body and the tampon, and the endless allusions to heteronormative vaginal sex, intimacy also lies in this particular internet group itself. Women of the feminist little tampon group are intimate with each other. Here they speak about the problems and predicaments and pains that people usually feel uncomfortable talking about. They articulate and display their bodily sensations, and the sharing and discussing of these sensations is highly effective. Because intimacy is not only about attachment or proximity, intimacy asks for a lot more. Here, I am thinking of Lauren Berlant's use of therapeutic publicity. Desire on its own may be unilateral. Intimacy, on the other hand, has to be shared. The unilateral desire goes from my end to the other end, but it does not necessarily get back to feel me. Intimacy gets back. It rebounds and rebounds in re resonances. Confronting the st stigmatism and taboo of menstruation, members of feminist little tampon group traverse boundaries of public and the private to talk about body, pain, vulnerability, looking for a collective recovery, as well as an understanding of their own bodies. And that is all. Thank you. out of these what seem like very disparate subjects. Um, I actually want to thank both of the, the speakers for really pushing me <laughs> to be able to do that and then I, I guess I'll give some introductory thoughts and then open it up for some conversations. Um, I, I was actually really struck by, uh, with, with both of the speakers, the idea of, of um, being without borders and what borders mean, both in terms of physical borders but also in ter terms of the kind of borders that technology allow us to, to move beyond. So there were, I saw within your talks, a number of borders that were being um, transgressed the sexual border, the border between the, the market or the, the creator and the, the consumer. Um, and also a sense of kind of racialized fantasies of how uh, within the fantasy realm the idea of race could be transgressed in some ways and then in some ways could be located as a source of, um, of, of negation for where these ideas come from. This is, this is a US kind of neoliberal body subject that somehow is disrupting an authentic sense of Chineseness and bodiness. So, um, 
Also, there's an idea of recuperation, I think, a kind of soaking up of excess and absorption, a kind of um, movement between animation and, uh, and fantasy through affect and through bodies that actually through both of your presentations really made me or invites me to think about um, what kinds of, uh, of borders we, we protect. And, and, and I write a chapter about Mike Tyson's facial tattoo and I start off by saying I want to circle my wagons using a, an American sort of colonial uh, phrase to think about protecting what I thought was mine. So uh, I think the way that you're both looking at about this through media is really exciting. And of course it makes me think about being mean and the idea of the imagined communities and, um, and imagined communities imagining. So there's some idea of a collective or communal visioning that's available through media that to me is really exciting. Um, my own work I'm looking at the use of images and uh, how they, they interpolate a kind of a body, a racialized body into, into, um, into reality, into material practices through images. And through that I've come to an idea of thinking about images as a kind of medicine. So that there are ways in which the, the, um, the online media, the imagining of a community becomes a response to a medicine for the kind of images that we're often subjected to without necessarily our consent. So that's going to be about my best attempt at um, drawing together uh, these two subjects and I just really wanted to open the floor for those of you who have questions for either of the speakers or who, who might like to have, have an attempt at drawing them together yourselves. <laughs> but thank you both very much, that was fantastic. interesting uh, research like uh, I, I actually did not go into uh, archives to look for that particular research by dr. Dickinson but it, it was it, it is discussed in a book called um, under wraps it's a, a book-length study of tampon and menstrual technology by uh, Sharon Wallstrol and can I you think that name? Can you spell that name? yeah sure it's um, Sharon? Uh, Shara, uh, sorry, I think it's S-H-A-R-R-A. -R -R -A. Let me look for it, I'm sorry. Yes, it's... Sorry, maybe we can discuss this later. Uh, yeah, well, the Vol Volstra is V-O-S-T-R-A-L, that is her last name. She has a couple of uh, studies of um, menstruation in general and especially the tampon. 
Yeah, and that particular research I found very um, interesting because yes, it, the research itself I don't think it is pr progressive or feminist or in, in any sense. It is a very normative research, but it does suggest that the tampon is safe as compared to the, the napkin, which is um, t the opposite to like the, the, like the general like, conservative ideology of the body. And I don't know how, how we make sense of that, but I think it's a point that worth developing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I look at horticulture's um, online, I look at like, Transcend, and there are some partners, but I look at them on YouTube. So I'm looking at an app that's supposed to be sort of in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you what you think about sort of the difference in the world of the people in terms of actual people, people or what you need to sort of create um, this very communal kind of media. Um, specifically, like, in regards to, let's say, like, hand fiction, right? Where you're taking um, object of characters and sort of eroticizing that in a different way versus something like this where it's a, it's a sort of self-contained kind of comic. And are, is there fan fiction that like, comes out of these communities that push those lines like, even further? It's sort of like a question that you need to ask. Um, well, that's one thing that makes these works so participatory is that the creators are actively encouraging fans to do things like that. And that is a major element to fandom of these groups, is developing those um, fan fictions. However, um, the real difference, I would say, between fan fiction and that is a lot of these pairings can actually then possibly appear in the actual work. And they're based off of characters where that was perhaps the original intent in the first place. Whereas with a lot of fan fiction, a lot of pairings were not as intended or were for other purposes, but really weren't originally the purpose of the character being created, especially within children's works. Maybe this might be a question from both of you. Although I was interested in your quoting of Berlant's therapeutic uh, publicity. And I just wonder, uh, both of you, either of you have, um, online communities are a strange sort of publicity because they're very self-contained into in, your own, your own privacy is your home. I mean, I know we have smartphones and everything, much that privacy is a little bit broken down. Um, but how do both of you read that therapeutic publicity that is so much actually really private is extending beyond the online space? Does that make sense? Yes, mm -hmm. that is a very good question. I, um, I could start since it <laughs> comes from uh, my presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, well, uh, the reason why that I am drawn to the word therapeutic is because um, in like these like stigmatized notions of menstruation and the tampon, there is a pathological element to it. I mean, the, the, the fear and compulsion, feelings of fear towards the tampon um, is um, somehow tied into the idea of like, like the able-bodiness and things like that. Uh, it, as if, if you use the tampon and your hymen is in danger and somehow like you're not uh, uh, able body anymore, that you, are, you have some pathological issues like that. Um, and uh, the, the sense of community that is uh, gained through the discussions on this particular internet group, um, they can counteract that particular path pathology to some extent. Because when you talk about things, um, you realize that this is not a very um, 
this is not something that only happens to you, it happens to everybody, and you get a, a sense of community and um, um, a, a shared lived experience. I think that is what, uh, that is how I respond to um, the therapeutic publicity. In terms of these comics, I think that one of the main goals of the creators is to actually spread them out through other forms of social media and to involve fans as much as possible and make it a very personal type of relationship. That's how works like these end up surviving. So in some ways, they're very insular within their own fan groups um, speaking, but in other ways, there's a real desire to use things like Facebook to branch out and to develop additional fans and to have a place to really talk about that fandom and continue to develop those sorts of relationships. And then that brings in a really interesting question of, again, how social media platforms are a tool in that case for, again, using, picking up on convergence culture, um, taking fans and people from one area and bringing them in to another. And I am doing research on that as well, which I think is particularly interesting. Um, unfortunately, I only had time today to speak about web comics, but there are, as I mentioned before, many ways the community is using these tools and there are many um, forms of media theory that are being used to analyze why these tools are effective. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I have a question for you, Ling. Um, I was wondering, because one or two of the quotes mentioned boyfriends, for instance, I was wondering, sort of a two-part question, if there was any discussion around um, for queer women, uh, or if that was brought up at all, and also if um, sort of this mentioning of the boyfriends, if it's an attempt to um, negotiate, I, I guess, acceptability through a heterosexuality. So I'm thinking back to the uh, birth control pill when it was first introduced. It was introduced in such a way that uh, told husbands that they can basically regulate their wife's schedule, and there it came with a schedule card, and it came with like all these things, and a watch to remind you to take your pill, and and um, Beatrice uh, Preciado discusses that in Testo Junkie. So what was interesting with that is just that basically the men had to be on board for women to use the birth control, and it had to be seen as promoting the heteronormative family. So I'm wondering if, if these discussions, a similar thing is happening with the tampon, where it is heteronormatized in a way to make it more accessible and say, okay, well, men can be part of this. That is a brilliant question, and I think it's very relevant because I'm also try. this paper is, uh, it comes from a s seminar course in um, science and technology studies, so what you just said is very relevant. Um, for the first part of your question, there is no discussion that I know of regarding like LGBT um, identities. The the whole website, the, the whole discussion um, forum is very heteronormative in that sense. And, but uh, the mentioning of boyfriend and heteronormative vaginal sex, I think it is, um, well, I would not assume that the people who use that word um, is conscious about this kind of like heteronormativity. But I do think that, like you said, acceptability is negotiated through this kind of heteronormative coupling. Because, for example, you have to say the word like boyfriend, which suggests a kind of like long term, like stable relationships. It is, um, uh, it is a way in, w in which. Um, well, it is a way in which, like the using the the using of the the usage of the tampon, and uh, the kind of like neoliberal Western feminism uh, are like being are being made to be accepted in a very conservative Chinese context. And w one other point to mention is that, in fact, 
Because the whole like Chinese cultural like mass media environment is um, much more conservative than uh, that in the United States, uh, the public mentioning of a boyfriend and the implication that you're actually having vaginal sex with your boyfriend is somewhat like transgressive already in that sense. You know, research that that goes into these into these studies that you know. On the, on, I mean, we're not here. They, so, they sound so absurd, you know, and and uh, you know, so extreme that it almost sounds like like performance art. It doesn't even, it doesn't even sound like you know, like like scholarship. I mean, not that you're not doing scholarship. It just seems like it's performance art, right? Um, because of the extreme, I don't know, whatever absurdity of, of some of the statements. Um, the heteronormativity of that research and the heteronormativity of the way that research is applied uh, is balanced, in, in, from what I could tell, by the intimacy uh, between the women who are writing to each other and who are giving each other you know, tips on masturbating and who are giving each other help on how to you know, get through these like really intimate uh, experiences. Um, and, and to me, that is um, um, almost like virtual lesbian sex. <laughs> you know, and so that is why the heteronormativity of the research and the, and the, and the virtual lesbianism of, of the praxis is just really fascinating to me as, as this internal contradiction to your, to your research. I don't know if you're going to, you know, like explore it further. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, yeah, you said you mentioned that you had another question. Yeah, yeah, I want to give you a chance to respond. No, I could. I I guess I could do that after you. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, it'll fit in because my question is uh, with both of your work. Um, in so many ways, it's very cutting edge. And um, uh, you know, one of the things that I always tell my grad students is that I want you to make original contributions, you know, to the literature. And I'm sure you've all heard that before. Um, so, so obviously, you're already poised to do that. But what, how do you see specifically the kind of intervention that you want to make with the, with this research? Mm. Let me answer first, since she's writing <laughs> right now. Um, the type of intervention that I'd like to make is really an increase in awareness of transgender identity. There is a major deficit right now within the United States um, of transgender identity, um, and there's a major issue right now with treatment of transgender people. California is very much an exception in terms of states, in terms of understanding, and even there's massive misunderstanding even within community spaces of what it actually means to be transgender and the just variety of experiences people go through and the difficulties people go through. Um, and in other places, it's gotten to an unacceptable level of violence. And the only way to combat violence and ignorance is really with a form of education. And to be able to talk about that education in a variety of forms, depending, different people glob onto different types of things. And it's important to have different sorts of sources for different individuals to get that information out there, whether that be a web comic, whether that be an internet group, whether that be a zine. There are a variety of forms of media that can all have different effects on different people. And it's vitally important that that information gets out there and that transgender people do have this platform to speak. Oftentimes, transgender voices are silenced. And it's very distressing. <laughs> As a transgender person, I've gone through it. And I'm sure plenty of other transgender people have gone through it. In fact, I know plenty of other transgender people have <laughs> gone through it as well. Um, I would like to thank you for your comment and uh, in the first place. Um, well, a bit of methodology at first. I think this is 
definitely not a work that is um, queer in the sense that it is specifically addressing, addressing LGBTQ issues or LGBT communities. I think for me, I, I am thinking about uh, it in queer terms because I have a lot of um, resources in queer scholarship and queer theory in general. I'm using those um, theories I'm, I'm using those theories in um, like a subject of study that is that it that it's not um, LGBT in 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 that sense, and it it, it could be rather like the subject itself could be rather heteronormative in some sense, and uh, on that account, I think definitely the challenge for me is how to address these issues of extreme heteronormativity without conforming to conforming to it. I think the, the problem of heteronormative in these particular discourses is um, what I would like to write about and what I would like to criticize, but I guess it's a struggle for me to navigate, especially to navigate different kinds of scholarship because I also have a lot of um, references in um, feminist scholarship which is not, um, that critique of heteronormativity well, in some ways. And um, what you mentioned, uh, the idea of intimacy, I think this is definitely the ultimate, not the ultimate, but the uh, a direction that I would want to go to if I develop this, this piece. I think what um, fundamentally interests me in the, the problem of the tampon is that they have intimacy, not only, well they have intimacy between these like virtual um, women members and they also have intimacy between uh, a body and a thing which is not that heteronormative either. I think these are the, the issues that I want to address in particular. And uh, for your last question on um, the c kind of contribution or development that I could make, I think of this as a very um, theoretical study. Um, my um, main interest is literary theory and critical theory. So I am writing about um, a kind of media, social media activism, but I guess I am not, um, well, I personally, I am more interested in the theoretical level. Thank you. I think we have time for another question. If there's anybody who <coughs> would like to add something. Do you have any comments for each other? I would also be interested in knowing how that applies or doesn't apply to people who are um, genderqueer or yes. identify outside of gender binaries. Yes, I'm thinking about that when I was and writing. What and that means for them. Do you, well, okay, this would be uh, evil of me, but do you have any suggestions yeah. for that? <laughs> well, I could, I could, okay, I could start with a, a, a little, I, I could say a few words because um, there, the website, the, the forum is so um, heteronormative and gender normative and the, the kind of language that they use, for example, when I was researching, I realized they only use like the, the feminine pronoun she because they assume that uh, like everybody who is menstruating <laughs> will definitely identify as a she. Um, so when I was writing this paper, I kind of, um, I, I was struggling to find a way to like substitute those like excessively uh, normative pronouns and everything like that. but. I guess in, in the end it's because the issue is so much biological, that's a bad word, but the, the issue is very clo closely tied, uh, tied to the, the body. It's, yeah, I, I think, well, it's definitely a good point to um, discuss, further discuss and it's definitely a difficulty, the realistic dif difficulty that I'm facing in my research. So if mm -hmm. you have any suggestions. Um, I actually do have a little bit of a suggestion, which is looking into zines. Zines mm -hmm. typically tell very personal accounts of things and are very good for really intimate conversations. People mm -hmm. are very willing mm -hmm. within zine culture to talk about themselves and the situations that they're in. 
I don't know a Vizine in particular off the top of my head mm -hmm. that would work for that, but I'm sure that there's probably one out there. Often gender non-conforming people um, are writers of zines. Certainly queer zines, that's yes. definitely the case. Yes. I was wondering if Rain had had an encounter with the tampon as a storyline. Sorry, what, what was that? The one of the characters from the comics, Rain, if oh, Rain. Had actually had an yeah. encounter with a tampon. There actually is a joke oh. in one yeah. of the Rain stories where one of her um, cisgender male friends is there and there's a cisgender woman that comes up and asks Rain for a tampon, and of course she gives her one, and of course he's a little bit horrified, like, why do you have... <laughs> a little bit confused. Yeah. But I think that's actually a wonderful note for us to finish on, is that, that actually the possibility of the confusion and the humor and the community that can come through sharing tampons. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, I think we'll take a break. It's time to get a little more caffeine before we come back together for our fantastic boys. Okay. Nice. So,